Hey everybody, it's me. It's Jeff from Jeff Has Cool Friends, and this is that's the show. You're list. I can't start a podcast properly. I just don't know how to do it. I thought that was perfect. You're perfect. Now you are. Uh, I mean, actually, what what better way to introduce yourself than saying, "Hey, it's me from the show you're already listening to. Yeah. That you saw my name when you downloaded it, but just reminding you, it's not somebody else. Well, it's me. There's Jeff a, May. There's an irony in that because I'm about to introduce you. Like they don't see the title of the episode coming. Right. Uh, because you are my very cool friend. You are an incredible. You're an actor, comedian, uh, author. Yeah. Uh, calendar model. True. Uh, cancer haver. As yeah, of now. <laughs> let's go, baby. Uh, my, my best credit to date. Alex Hooper. Alex, how are you? You know, actively dying. Uh, but other than that, what a- actively living at the same time? Okay, but honestly, aren't we all actively dying? You know, there's that cake lyric. As soon as you're born, you start dying. So you might as well have yeah. a good time. Yeah, I think cake, cake were the ones that came up with that idea. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think they were the ones. That you know, ex- sheep yeah. go to heaven, goats go to hell. Of course. So, yep. They every if you just need to look to a modern day philosopher, may I suggest the cake album Golden Nugget? Yeah. Everybody, <laughs> and that sheep go to heaven. That video was wasn't that directed by Trey Parker and Matt Stone. Oh my God, I have no idea, but what a great piece of trivia that would be if that's true. I think it is. I think it's, or at the very least, it's South, it's a South Park style animation. Of that oh, video, cool. If I recall, but I, I don't know. Alex, you are, you are a fascinating person, somebody that I've been meaning to get on. And then, you know, you made an announcement yesterday <laughs> that was a real, because like, here's the thing is I had you on Mint on Card last month yeah uh and and i was like god I, you're so interesting you're so fun you've got such an interesting thing and especially after the game show that i was on because we both kind of got huge bumps from howie mandel for sure yeah um he gave me a lot of cocaine in the green room at america's got talent giant bumps I, and i got no cocaine from him oh really? why do you think he has as much as much energy as he does well we he's, he's a, a millionaire Oh, okay. I thought it was the massive piles of blow. That no, he's no, doing. he's just rich. They just get a different life. That's very true. They just, but they, yeah, we are connected in that way now, where we've both been on technically game shows yeah. um, with Howie, and yeah, it's a uh, it's an interesting <laughs> it's an interesting connection. I could see there was a slight disappointment. I was on a really good streak when I was winning, and I hit a point, my mathematical leave point, and I was like, I'm gone. And he, he was like, but you're doing so well. Like, why would you stop? And I'm like, because this is how much I need <laughs> to fix my life. Right. And if I lose more than half of it, if I get a question wrong, even though I probably won't, that 15% would then bring my life back to kind of I would love, I love watching game shows when the person's like, you know what? It's enough to get my son the treatment that he needs, but you know what? Mama also wants a car, so let's let it ride. Let's do this, baby. And then they fail the next question, and they're like, well, I guess my son won't get his new prosthetic leg that I promised him. And some millionaire game show host is like, ooh, better luck next time. Oh, gosh, you really should have studied your state capitals there, Lorraine. Yeah, I'm going to go get, I'm going to go make a ton of money to work four days and for three weeks and make a f- fortune. Um, what a life. So yeah, you, you were, went on America's Got Talent. You've been on several times actually. Yeah. But two seasons. The, the, there's, you started with the bomb of all bombs primarily. And, and I, cause I've watched it several times like recently just to see it. And it really comes into the fact that like you brought because you're you're a roaster like that's like one of the main styles of com- comedy that you're well known for you've been on roast battle yeah funny enough it's what i'm known for it's not what i consider myself but you know you fall into these yeah, you don't get lanes and that, categories right? and yeah you have to embrace what it is i can mm-hmm. for a while i tried to fight against it, like i'm not a roaster i'm a f- comedian people and then you go wait where am i getting most of my work yeah Okay. What pays your bills? That was for me the shift where I made from being comedian, comedian slash podcaster to podcaster slash comedian is I'm like, oh, I make a thousand times more doing podcasting than I have doing stand up. Right. So it's like, well, podcaster, I think, is number one now. <laughs> like, yeah. It just is what it is. And it's also, it's a bit jarring if you are taken off the specific path that you had planned. And that's a good reminder that 
life does not care about your plans. No, it does not at all. And I think um, that you just have to, like I said, embrace whatever work you're getting and not fight against it. Like I was one of these people who like Jeff Ross is my friend. And I was like, I don't want to be like a Jeff Ross. And I'm like, wait, I don't want to play arenas and do the Hollywood Bowl and sell out everywhere I go and still do stand up. And I, I would like to add, you do not want to have sex with a child. No, that's true. I don't want to do that part either. But, <laughs> you know, you know, nightmares do come true. Boy, 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 um, do, boy, do people not care about that for some reason? <laughs> yeah, I get I understand that he he's somebody that has uh, pursued the avenue of, of building up your career as well through the roast uh, battling and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I uh, you're not going to get a lot of love for him from me on that. I understand uh, that. There's a lot of people that will that not I, do it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I went on there to roast the judges and because that's what I was chosen to do. I was yeah. sought out, seeked out, sought out to do it. And, you know, it's just one of those moments in your life when you have no idea what's going to happen. And the absolute, uh, like you said, hardest bomb of uh, of my life, for sure, of most comedians that would ever have an opportunity like that. I, I, I watch like the first time I watched it, like I did that thing where my hands are over my nose and mouth. And I, and I was just like, oh, f because it's it was a spectacular bomb with good jokes, which a lot of comedians have had. Ask me about the cancer fundraiser someday <laughs> okay. uh, in which I wrote jokes about cancer for the fundraiser and I bombed my face off so hard and it's so much better that I bombed because I have that story instead of having one good set that is that is true about a bomb is that if you have a decent set you usually even a great set you're not going to talk about it no. you just go home that night and you go to bed and you wake up the next day you and feel you move good on with your life yeah. yeah but when you have a bomb literally you question your entire existence and that's when you really grow those yeah. are the ones that change you i bombing to me because i think at this point in time like they still happen but they happen a lot less as you season yourself and everything like that but when they happen in the moment it's kind of one of my favorite things about comedy because then you're like oh none of my material matters time to burn this place to the ground and that is so funny to me like watching comedians bomb when i know they're great comedians yes and, and bombing yourself is so funny i remember speaking of agt we got picked, uh, there was a group of us that got picked that were like relatively good, I'd say mid-tier comics at the time, to compete for a spot for in AGT. It was like a, one of those contests that like flappers or whatever. And uh, it was like me, like Justin Foster, Wendy Starling, all very capable, very funny comedians. And they put uh, Drew Lynch on that. Like uh -oh. they, they handpicked him. Because they were like, well, he's going to win. And they put a bunch, and we all saw it, and we were like, well, this guy, there's no way that we're going to beat him for a couple of reasons. One, he's very funny. He's incredibly funny. Two, he was like the Flappers home team captain. Yeah, and say number three. Uh, <laughs> And number it's, three, his story is so much better than ours. That's a very kind way of putting it. Well, uh, no, he, I mean, he, he has a stutter and he used it well. Yes. Uh, AGT loves disabled performers. They love a good story. They, they, that's what they want. They eat it up. In fact, when I went back on AGT the second time, um, after I'd done my initial performance and we were going into the live shows, the producers were like, would you be willing to make fun of the show? itself and i straight up went you don't want me to do that and they said why not and i was like do you want me to tell you that any mediocre performer as long as you have a disability will make it to the finals and they went jesus what and i they, is that how you think of the show i was like that's how everyone thinks you're, you're like show. that's not how i think of the show it's what i've seen on the show yeah hi drew lynch is a hilarious comedian yeah. i'm not taking that away from him for a second but if you look at the people who have done very well on that show comedians specifically sam comro ryan nymiller drew lynch you know these are people that have something different well, about them well i think the thing is is like America loves like a, a an underdog. Yes. And like, there's like we all knew going in like myself, Justin Foster, we knew we're not that underdog. Like, look, I'm six, four. I'm a six foot four white guy. 
Yeah. Like I'm, there's zero underdog other than my career choice uh, in that regard. So we actually all decided that we would purposefully make our last joke be the bombiest joke we can imagine. <laughs> And because we were like, look, we're not going to win. So let's do a killer set. And then our last joke just tank. And we tried to have like a contest on who could have the tankiest joke. And I think it was Wendy Starling because I think she like started because she has this really very funny bit about being assaulted. And she just did the opening line. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> and it just <laughs> that she just said that. Uh, and she, you know, she used a word that I don't want to use. She used the new R word. I gotcha. Uh, and, and which, boy, I've tried using, tried doing a joke about that one time. You're talking about the four letter R word, correct? Yes. 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 Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not six letters, four letters. Yep. Um, an unusable word on stage. It's just an, it's just such a word. It's such a weighted word. You lose the crowd no matter what. You do. Uh, and she bombed purposefully in a way that I've, I've it, it was like driving the titanic into the iceberg it was so funny it, it was like a legendary thing that i got to see oh so i funny. love that yeah there's there's something beautiful about watching a bomb because killing you're watching someone in their element doing this beautiful dance where nothing can go wrong and there is something amazing about that but a bomb is so unpredictable and you watch somebody panic and struggle and try to dig their way out of any hole that they you're you're yeah. grasping at whatever you can do to get out of that you thing. see them doing the 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 chemistry in their head to figure out what ingredients aren't working yeah and and it's it's fun like sometimes like fundraisers are probably the worst places to do stand up especially like if it's for like if it's like a little league fundraiser, because it's all these parents that are that finally get away from their kids. Yeah, I've done little league uh, fundraisers where you just sit there and you're like, I drove to Long Beach for this. <laughs> and at the end, I remember it was Caitlin Cut uh, had booked it and she booked it was like me and Adam Todd Brown and um, all very capable and funny comics that were just just bombing our faces off because we couldn't compete with not being near your children. And then. Keith Carey was was the last comic up and she just goes, just burn this to the ground. And she, <laughs> Which that's a great person to tell to burn it to the ground. Keith Carey, and if you don't know him, he, he's an excellent roaster. He he's uh he's he's gross. He's purposefully gross about about how he does stand up and stuff like that. And he told all these like conservative Orange County parents all he did was like roast them and tell jokes about fucking dudes. Oh my gosh, perfect. And you just saw like the abject terror and shock hit where he's like afterwards he was like you might need to walk me to my car yeah and i'm like i don't want to die too and meanwhile like, that organization's like didn't i say to get a magician didn't <laughs> i say that everyone you all laughed at me when i said get a magician i love how much comedians hate magicians and magicians are so talented i <laughs> uh, see i don't hate magicians i have nothing against them because i work the comedy and magic club a lot yeah. and one of my some of my favorite acts are the magicians because they break up the show yeah. and i just think it's so interesting to watch this thing that i when when I watch a magician, I don't know how you do it, but when I watch a magician, I do not try to figure out no. how they did it. I allow myself to be suspended in disbelief and just go, oh my God. Wizards I can't. are real. Yeah. Yes. It's more fun that way. Yeah. When you see, like, have you ever been to the Magic Castle? I have a story about accidentally piercing the veil and seeing a peek behind the curtain. Uh -oh. We went to one of the tables at the Magic Castle, which yeah. has like five seats. Yeah. And I was in a party of six. Okay. It was like me, Whitney Melton, Kim Crawl, Aaron Peter, like a, a bunch of us were there. And I was being polite and I was like, you guys take the seats. I will, I'll stand in the back. Like you guys get comfortable, I'll stand. And the angle at which I was standing, I just saw all the all the moves that oh, the guy hilarious. That the was doing. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, oh, I just volunteered to like ruin like wonder. <laughs> Like, like I, I just sacrificed being fancy free tonight. There always are those people that are like, you guys know this isn't real. Blah, blah. I'm like, F you. Like, in the same way that I know that, you know, Will Smith is not actually jumping over a truck on his motorcycle. Yeah, and I can't, yeah. I can't dunk a basketball, but I love watching people that can dunk a basketball. 
dunk a basketball. Right. I can't do these tricks. Yeah. There's a skill involved and I would rather go, that's incredible. I have no idea how he did that. Do I think it's actual magic? No, but do I think it took a ton of time to learn whatever sleight of hand that they just uh, yeah. performed? Incredible. That you did your job. seamlessness is so wild. The, the disrespect for magicians in the comedy community, it's like, you know, you just do cum jokes in an Italian restaurant. Like, like, like <laughs> there's, there's no like. We've been to Sardo's. <laughs> yeah, there, there's no like the, the, the up our own asses that a lot of comedians are. And the idea of like, like, for example, I was having this conversation not too long ago, which is um, they're being like, well, you know, we're not getting headliners out and people aren't coming to the show. And I'm like, people don't come out to L.A. for the headline. Like there are six famous comedians in like the real world. We are so right. we're, oh, yeah. we're so in our own world that we think somebody who has like a 100,000 Twitter followers were like, I can't. Can you imagine? Ask anybody in Indiana who that person is sure. and, and it'll be like nobody. Well, I was also, I mean, I was hanging out with my, with my, my, one of my best friends the other day. And I was, t- I mentioned, I brought up Whitney Cummings for some reason. He goes, I don't even know who that is. And I was like, okay, you've been one of my closest friends for 20 years. You've watched me since the beginning of my time doing comedy and still one of the biggest comedians. People don't you know. have no f- idea. People know Dave Chappelle. Sure. People know Seinfeld. This right? is like and, and Chris Rock. There's again, it's like six people and it's usually people that are divisive or, or like Joe Rogan. Sure. Or, well, or I mean, at, at this and point, everyone. And it's like, well, that's that. not a comedian at this point. Like, you know, like there's so many things people like there's only so much knowledge people have. And in comedy, we're so insulated that we're like, oh, this person's huge. It'd be like, I would kill to see Todd Glass. Mm-hmm. But then, like, you ask your average person in Little Rock who Todd Glass is, and they're like, they don't know. That's why when people go, who's your favorite comedian? I go, well, I don't know how into it you are. But if I said Kyle Kinane, would that mean anything to you? And 99% of the time they go, no. And you're like, he's and the I'm, voice of Comedy Central. I'm just, oh. he, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was for many. Like, yeah. I'm like, it's one of those people where it's just like, well, now that I've told you that, go look them up. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Where, yeah, we are, when you're part of that world, and obviously we know thousands of comedians, that we don't think, like, even people with Netflix specials, they have no idea that they're there. Yeah. Because if that doesn't, if the algorithm doesn't feed you exactly what it feeds us, which obviously we're going to see a lot more comedy yeah. on ours, then... That's just the way it goes. Yeah, it is. It's wild. So AGT, right? You you bomb your f- face off. Oh yeah. Uh, just, I mean, the, the the pure hatred that Heidi Klum had for you in that was just delicious. Yeah, she got up and hit Simon's ex. Oh no, Mel B did that. Oh, Mel yeah. B did it. Yeah. Mel B did it, but Heidi was very not happy oh, okay. with me anyway. I mean, she's like, "I hope you got whatever it was out of your system," and I was like, "Oh no, you've only fed this beast so much more and, than you ever could have imagined." And you didn't interact with them outside of the on the show. I've on the only ever spoken to Howie, um, Terry Crews, because he hosted the second season I was on, and I did. A, I, I went further in the in the show, and so him and I like shot stuff together and stuff. So I interacted with Terry a bunch but i i specifically like asked if i could tell sophia and heidi that like if i could talk to them and go you know this is a joke and i love you both and i yeah. think you're amazing human beings not just amazing women but humans you have you have taken so much so much and been with what you have you're more than just these beautiful models like you are showrunners your actors yeah. your producers your everything and i just wanted to tell them that and they producers were like you can't like we can't have you go anywhere near them I, I get that because of covid stuff mainly because yeah. my 2020 se- i did 2020 and my, well, my second season and that's the covid season yeah i also think it's one of those things where they have to make sure that there is a separation when it's a judging thing because of how tightly regulated game show and competition shows can be. Yeah. Um, and that's, I would do, I would love to just talk to Simon Cowell for five minutes because I know he enjoys what I do. Oh yeah. But the only he's, one I've ever spoken to is Howie. He's clearly a fan of yours. Simon Cowell was. Yeah. Like you could see it even in the first one. He was like, he was like, I love this, but these guys aren't feeling it at well, all. Well, cause he, 
can laugh at himself. Yeah. And that's what I didn't think would happen when I went on that show was I didn't realize that this huge conversation would start about how celebrities take themselves too seriously because that was never my intention. My intention was just to go on there being a silly doofus, say some jokes, flap, flap my tail around and be like, okay, isn't this fun? And then it just, the internet turned it into something completely different yeah. where it was, wow. Wait, wait the internet? Took something and, and warped it to create its <laughs> the, own. The uh, first thing. time that's ever happened. Yeah. But suddenly people were like, this is ridiculous. This no name comedian comes on here wearing this stupid costume and these billionaires can't handle it. Yeah. Get out of here. It, it was uh, it was very funny uh, watching. And then so did you get invited back on? I pitched myself to the producers. Okay. So I was uh, trying to get back on TV, whether it be a late night set or whatever, but I was unrepped and I didn't yeah. have means to do it. Because you had just gotten corporate. Yeah, I had done corporate. I'd done that TV show. Um, I had done Comedy Central's Roast Battle, done America's Got Talent. So things were like happening, but I still didn't, I was still pitching myself always. And a lot of, TV producers and like people that make decisions of who, what comedians are going to go on TV. They're like, if you're not dealing with like an agent or a manager, they don't take you seriously. No, they sure don't. So I reached out to AGT and I said, Hey, this was such a popular thing. What if we did it again? And they said, well, what would that look like? And then I pitched them the whole, I'm going to go on there and apologize. But through my apologies, roast them all over again by starting with I'm so sorry that this and then turn it into a joke and they immediately jumped all over it they were like we love this so much let's do it like yeah let's have you back and that just goes to show you mean you got to make things happen for yourself yeah. nobody that's everyone thinks that they asked me to come back they did not I asked them it, I told them I think this would be great and they agreed it seems well because it, it's there's several reasons why I think most people think that one because most of us know how this town how broken and weird this town is. Two, it did very much seem like you were given you were granted a second chance until like, they get peeked behind the thing and be like, oh no, you you kicked that door back in, yeah, and and received a lot of success off of that. Yeah, that is such a great show about like the of show of like the believing in yourself aspect of this, which is awesome. Like that's so cool. That's like really amazing to hear. You have to believe in yourself out here. Like the thing yeah. is, is there's this blind confidence that we all need to have that is also riddled with anxiety and depression and every other mm -hmm. feeling of I'm never going to make it. But you have to have this thought of, I know what I can do. And I know, and honestly, that that first America's Got Talent showed that in the face of adversity, I can stand tall, hold my own, and do my job. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge moment for me because I left that show thinking I had failed. And then it airs two and a half months later while I am going through every horrible thought in my mind for those two months. Like my, I'm dead. My career's over. If they ever air any part of this, I'm so screwed. And instead it was the exact opposite of that. Yeah. And then I was like, Oh, not only does this look good, but this makes me as a comedian look very good. It's bold. It's confident and it does its job in spite of the thinness of the skin that was received on the other end, which is just the average crowd that was watching. Like, here's the thing is like roast style comedy. It's not the most popular style of comedy. No. It's niche, but that niche is going to be seen by a lot of people when you're on something like America's Got Talent and those people are going to find you. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I, mean, I went on that show thinking, okay, most of the people that watch the show are going to hate this, but 10 million people watch the show every week. So if I got 1% of them to like me, it's that's 100,000 people. That's pretty good. Yeah. I didn't realize that most of the people, the fans that I would get from that would be when they put it on the internet, because then it's people that would have never watched that show mm -hmm. going, look what this dude just brought yeah, to just here. Did on NBC. And that's what, there was so, it's so funny. There are certain people that really didn't get it. And these are like comedians that reached out. They're like, Alex, I don't know why you're going on that show. That's not the right show for you. And I'm like, that's, that's why you're the doing it. point.
point. Yeah. Because that's what makes this so uncomfortable, cringe, and ultimately hilarious yeah. is that I am in the wrong place to do this. And I am fighting a losing battle. And somehow I got all the way to the live shows by doing a thing that everyone told me not to do. And that's awesome. Yeah. Like that's so rad. You've also been featured on Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> You're on Ellen. And like, cause you did a pug yoga calendar, uh, which was just a little goofy thing that you, you put out there. Uh, and from what I understand, and, and this is my guess, I'm guessing Adam Yenser was the one that saw that and yeah. brought it up there. Yeah. Adam, who I literally was just talking about on me and Kim's show, uh, Ugg Fine, were being like the conservative comic that didn't go off the deep end. Yeah, Adam Yenser is one of those rare, like I've known him pretty much since I started. Yeah. And immediately I I watched this guy and I was like, this is one of the best joke writers that I'm that I'm seeing right now. And uh, of all the people I'm seeing in this scene, this guy knows how to craft a punchline and a setup. And so he's a writer for Ellen. And yeah, I was announcing the Pug Yoga calendar. And again, I actually, I'm pretty sure I reached out to him and I just sent him a message saying, Hey man, I'm making these calendars. I don't know why Ellen would want anything to do with this. Um, oh no, no, no. I didn't reach out. He did reach out to me because he said, Hey, I see you made this calendar every year. We do a segment where Ellen shows weird calendars at the beginning of the year. And I think this would be perfect. Can you bring us a couple of them? And so one of those, again, I'm making a calendar of my pug and I doing yoga all over Los Angeles. It's just a silly idea that I don't think, I, I don't know what's going to come from it, but you get a brilliant photographer, Troy Conrad, who is great. Troy Conrad, my headshots, super, yeah. super excited about it. Him and I worked together. I brought in my friend, John Cranston to design the hell out of this thing. And then I just put as much work as I could into it and as much love as I could. So knowing that people that bought this, this calendar, a $20 calendar is like, you know, 20 bucks, whatever, but people don't need calendars. So I wanted to make sure that anyone who bought this went, I'm glad that I bought this. This was worth the money I paid for it. And sure enough, the Ellen thing was just such a boost in confidence. And this was also 2018 when I did America's Got Talent, like the same year, it was before that, but I was like, look at the silly that is succeeding yeah. because I did it because yeah. I believed in it. You don't like do whatever the, you want. Yeah. That was like such a huge message for me of like, stop trying to fit into other people's boxes. If you have an idea, even if it's bombastic and insane, if you are into it, just do it. I wish that had clicked with me in my twenties, but how could or it? Well, I mean, a lot of people started comedy in their 20s. And, you know, like if I had been more true to myself, I would have been really big in the nerd world in that like and I and I like where I am. But I do think of that sometimes more because I gave my entire 20s to teaching. But how do you tell yourself that in your 20s? No, because you, you don't. Can't. The tw your 20s are for literally figuring out, making all the mistakes and figuring out what direction you would like to point yourself in when you get to your 30s. And I kind of did the opposite of that and then accidentally fl like I cracked <laughs> like because like I did the other thing where I went by the script. I graduate. I had, I graduated. I I had just turned twenty two mm -hmm. when I started teaching, and I I started teaching from like the very beginning of twenty two to the end of thirty. So that entire time was me just being like, well, this is the job you do, and you have you know you stay in your hometown and you and you do the job, and I I never really got to take risks because now I was a a, a public figure locally. Sure, I couldn't do anything because I'm I was a very easy person to pick out of a crowd whatever I didn't, I wasn't, if I could have done comedy, then somebody sees me saying, you know, these kids are ass or something on stage, then you lose your career. Yeah. Or whatever. Like very, that was very much so. And I think that's interesting though, because now, because now you get to make those mistakes in your thirties yeah. and you know, I did get to make those mistakes in my Hell 30s. yeah. We dude, we all need to do that. Like yeah. you, like, you know, I know it's an easy thing to say, but you got to get kicked in the face a bunch of times. Yeah. I tell everyone that that moves to, uh, people ask me like, how do I become a comedian? How do I move to LA? How do I have a career in entertainment? And I'm like, look, whatever it is, I'm so excited for you Just start your journey, start working on it but talk to me about when you get kicked in the face for the first time the, the suffering aspect of it like 
I don't I don't agree necessarily in paying dues. I think talent brings you to where you are. But like to expect not to suffer or make sacrifices for a career, which I do see a lot now. And it's like one of the few old man thoughts that I get, you know, like when I hit there is when people are like they they kind of expect things to be easier or handed to them. I'm like, no, you have to eat. Shit. So you learn how to get through. You have to get tough. Like it shouldn't be easy. I'm still eating. Shit. Uh, do you know how many do you know how many auditions I have per year that I don't get? Mm. Most almost all of them. Yeah. 99% of them. It is it is a life of rejection yeah. when you choose this, but with that rejection comes this pure elation anytime you are succeeding. You are the person. And then that becomes this thing where the, hopefully the wins get closer together, but the further they're stretched out and you're going, God, I just, will something go right for me? And then it does. Yep. And you go, oh, right, this feeling that I've been chasing. Then here it is again. And all those other things weren't for me. They yep. weren't supposed to be for me. I, it's funny too because I was uh, I was re as I was doing my research I was like looking through a lot of stuff and and something I found out that was very interesting and, and is kind of a reminder of just how invested I was in you you were literally on the second mint on card that we ever did oh that's awesome like the like I had done the first one and then we were like okay we're doing this regularly I need killers and I pulled you on to that show that's awesome what um, an honor just just knowing that because that would have been more an honor to be on the first but you know but... <laughs> Just kidding. I know. Deal with it, bro. <laughs> but like anytime you see somebody on those, like, or, like I, cause I'll go back and look at the first ones and you look at it and you're like the people that I believed in, like the talent level, when you look at it and you see where these people end up or where they, where they go now. And you're like, yeah, see, like by respecting and loving and, and being a fan of people, not because of their name, but because of the craft and how hard they work and showing where they go versus where they were six years ago for example in february when we when we started this thing yeah uh it's just fascinating to me well the one of the beauties of this is stand-up comedy for the most part is a solo sport however you are surrounded by your peers and you want them to succeed and you wish for for, for me personally anyway i know there's other people out there like i wish everyone else would die and there can be only one but i'm a person who go yes i want to watch jeff sell a tv show and get to be a producer and get to yeah. act in his own thing i want to watch all these people live out their dreams that like, like you mentioned corporate, I got to be on corporate on the very first day of filming. And these are Jake Weissman, Matt Engelbrecht, and Pat Bishop who created and starred in the show. I did open mics with them for years mm -hmm. while we were starting out. And suddenly I am on day one and I'm eating lunch and I look at Jake and I go, do you realize you are in charge of millions of dollars? right now that you are gifting all of your comedy friends, these oh little God, yeah. roles and these like, it's every like watching that show was great. Cause I'd be like, there's Greg Edwards on this Babs gray and there's Alex. And it right. was just so fun. Your character is so funny, by the way. Oh, yeah. thanks. That was uh yeah, that was, and that was a thing. So I got, and I got that email. I was up for a writing job and a huge commercial on the, in the same week. And I was like, one of these is going to do one of these is going to go for sure. Like I know one of these is going to go and I'm it's not going to say my life will be changed, but something uh, it's a big win. Mm -hmm. I didn't get either of those. And I found out in the same day and I was like, damn it. And the next day I wake up to an email the, from my commercial agent that says, Hey, this TV show reached out to us. They don't want you to audition. They just want to hire you. And I was like, what is it? And then I found out it was corporate. And you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. That sounds about right. And I was like, Oh, I wasn't even thinking this was a thing. I was focused on these other two uh, actual opportunities that were in my face. But then here from the depths of whatever comes this other thing, because I do believe that all of the work you do compounds on itself in some way. And you never know when you're making an impact when seven years later, this person in an audience that you didn't know was a producer goes, I got the perfect thing and I know exactly who I want to do it. That's um, actually how I ended up getting the uh, the game show. Really? I didn't, I didn't apply for it. Just so somebody was like, I know a guy who's, who'd be great for this. It was a producer that had seen me because like, I don't go out for game shows. Like I never really would do the things. I've been on three. 
Okay. One, two, lost one. Um, but I've been, and it was really, it was Kim Crawl, our friend Kim Crawl, co-host of Ugg Fine with Kim Crawl. Oh, yeah. Uh, she would want to do these things, and she, she would bring me on as her fake boyfriend for us to do, like, team competition game shows, like trivia and stuff like that. And what would happen was I was just really eerily good at trivia. Like one of my dreams was to be on Jeopardy. And thank God I didn't because I'd have been slumming it financially. <laughs> but one of the guys who was a producer on one of those shows that really liked me after we finished, he's like, hey, man, even if you don't get on this, like, I'm going to find something for you. And it was five years later. Right. I mean, he he had sent me stuff before. Oh, you're interested in this, interested in that. And then he's like, um, so we have this thing. The potential for prize money is the highest I've ever seen as far as what I've personally worked on. He's like, it's something that I think you specifically are made for. Nice. And I was like, sure. But because it's a game show and be, I, I was like, fine, whatever. Tried not to get excited about it. Months of preparation for this show between like the interviews and the Zoom calls and and like the all the vetting that we had to go through finally ends up that they're like, all right, you're coming to Albuquerque. And I'm like, and I had to go to Albuquerque. That's where they were shooting. Netflix has a whole studio yeah. in Albuquerque. So yeah, like, yeah, they film a lot of, I mean, I know they shoot a lot of stuff yeah. in like Santa Fe and Albuquerque. Yeah, so it doesn't surprise me, but a game show that so like, normally they just pick a lot and just do it. No, they, but it was, it was, I mean, the stage was huge and you know, it was this whole thing. And we get there and I'm like, all right, well, I'm here, but also like it's a fucking game show. There's no guarantee of anything. And just the 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 whole me not trying to get too excited about it because I've been burned. I've had pilots taken away from me by networks and like it's like that where I was just like, it's fine, whatever. And then it didn't really hit me until I was like done filming. And I looked at one of the I looked at one of the the grips or something that was like one of the guys that was just like there to be like, all right, stand here on your mark you know, for whatever. And I just looked at him and I went, did I just win $250,000? He's like, you sure did, buddy. Hell yeah. And I was just like, that's wild. And he's like, yeah. Yep. <laughs> he's like, yeah. And then, then my knees got weak. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where like, it's like, it's like, <laughs> it's like being stabbed. You initially don't realize yeah. that you've been You're stabbed. In shock. Yeah. You just don't realize. And then, uh, 30 seconds later, you start screaming because you realize that this has actually happened yeah. to you. Oh, no, I've been stabbed. It's that moment. It's, you know, that was a, I, most people haven't been stabbed. How about a car accident? Everyone is that a little better? Um, You know, but yeah, it's one of those things that, that didn't just happen. No, that everybody happen. should be stabbed once. I think so. If you want to do well in this town, you need to suffer and sacrifice. Sometimes that's being stabbed. Show me your head wounds, everybody, and I'll tell you how far you can make it in Hollywood. One time I saw the coolest thing. I saw, uh, well, I have two stabbed stories. One's in Albuquerque. Two where I, I saw a guy get hit by a car and then get stabbed. Okay. It's, it was it was <laughs> unbelievably wild. I talk about it on, on stage. Uh, a man was in the crosswalk and just this like white explorer or escalate like white suv just like hits him like you'd see in like a, a cartoon where it like hits him and then he like rolls and he doesn't know how to pro he gets up and starts like beating the shit out of the car and the person in the passenger seat gets out and stabs him and then they just take off oh my god and i was like what the f and then my friend who lives in albuquerque is like f fridays dude <laughs> and I and I was just like, that's how you guys do Friday? Yeah, that's uh no, man, that's a Saturday night, if anything. That's Dude, a, it, but I also saw, uh, back when I was a bouncer in Worcester, I saw somebody, uh, one of the other bouncers, get a knife pulled on him. And he does this. He puts his hand up, and he goes, I don't want any trouble. And then he, like, does this weird slap with his hands at the guy's hand where he hits, like, the wrist, the back of the wrist, and then the front of the hand, and just sends the knife flying. And beats this dude mercilessly. Guy pulled the knife on him. He's like, I don't want any trouble. Slap, knocks the knife out and just drills the dude so hard. Oh, God. And I looked at that and I was just like, that was like some roadhouse. I've never been in a fight, but that's the kind of fight I would love to be in. I, nobody, I, when I was a bouncer, I've been in one skirmish for the entire time. Because nobody picked a fight with the tall guy. Yeah. But like, 
pick the fight with the tall guy because he's just going to like slap you around a little and get you out. He's going to disable you. You pick a fight with a short guy. That guy's got 25 years of shit built up. Yeah, he's exactly. Take out on you. <laughs> I remember when Melissa told me that I was not tall enough to be her boyfriend. And now with all this rage is coming out on you. There's like this. There was one guy whose like forehead was nose and mouth height for all these other bros. And he would just headbutt them. And they would just drop and then he would drag them out. And I was like, I wouldn't have done that. Nope. I would have just maybe locked your arm up and walked you out. Like I would have been very polite about that. But instead you picked a fight with that guy and now you have to get surgery. I used to get out of fights as a kid by telling whoever wanted to fight me that my eczema was contagious. And if I'm just, I'll just rub it all over so you. And they, you know, a nine year old, a 12 year old doesn't know that this skin disease that is all over me won't be all over them if i say yeah this is contagious so go ahead and fight me but you're gonna look like me tomorrow it's gonna get grayscale in great game of thrones or some shit. <laughs> yeah very much so like are you ready to look like an alligator because yeah. it's not gonna feel good and then they'd be like this isn't worth it you uh know? yeah and it was uh, of course it was worth it. It was worth it. Violence is so great. Yeah. I have, man, I'm looking at my notes. I have so much stuff to talk about. Oh yeah, please keep too. going. I got nothing but time. Um, one of the, one of the, my favorite things that you did a couple years ago, I think this was around 2018, maybe, uh, you did awesome person recognition. 2016, day. 2016, 2016. Okay. Yeah. 2016. You did 365 days. 366. It was a leap year. Oh, you <laughs> stupid son of a bitch. I f- cursed that leap year when I realized it was, <laughs> I was like, God damn it. Another f- Day of this. But you literally, you picked a day to write nice things about 366 people that you knew. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved it. I loved reading them. It was like my favorite thing that year. Thanks. Um, I was blown away that I actually got one. Yours? I had to, I researched yours because yours specifically. So for those, so let me just give a little background. So 2016, I have this idea to just like, I had a great New Year's Eve 2015 and going into 2016, I was like, I just want to be more positive and celebrate these amazing people that I know. And I never had any plan to do it for a whole year, but I just started writing little things. Hey, look at this person, watch this clip that they have, read this thing, listen to their podcast, whatever it is, you know, kick their ashtrays, um, do what whatever it may be. And it just kept going and going and going. And by the time I got to, I think about 60, 70, I was like, okay, I think I'm going to do this for the whole year. I think I have enough people that I can do this. And I wouldn't tell people I was doing it. So you would just get tagged in a post on Facebook said Alex Hooper's tagged you in a post. And then you would open it up and I will have written paragraphs about how you inspire me, how you're such a cool person, whatever it may be. And the more I did it, the better it felt. I kept feeling like I was getting stronger, like I was changing as a person. I felt that how could I ever be depressed and not grateful when most people in the world, they couldn't name a hundred people yeah. that are close that are close enough for them to write about, let alone 366. Yeah. And I took that as a t- place of privilege. And I so I used it to the best way I knew how to celebrate people. And I'm sure it was slightly embarrassing for some people. But I also know that a lot of people reach out and were like, dude, my parents are asking who you are and stuff because yeah. they're what is this? Like this is if you don't know what the what like it was just a weird thing to do to celebrate people like that so randomly. And I remember yours specifically, I researched all of these comic book characters yeah. so that I could put it in there with all of this very insular knowledge that I didn't know anything about. It was delightful when I read it. I'm glad because I, yours was one of the ones that I actually like, I, I was like, there's something specific I can do with this and make it different than the others. It's, it, it is very kind. It felt like you saw me in a way that not a lot of people do because you did boil that down. And I think people see it now more because I've obviously been on mic for, you know, I've been in people's ears for eight years now. Um, but the aspect of, wow, eight years, no, nine years. Hell yeah, dude. Oh man. Goes um, quick. The, whew, which, Time which, flies when you're watching somebody get stabbed. You yeah, have to get hit by a car. Every couple of years you just see someone get stabbed. Friday. But that, and so I, I really, really loved it. But you wrote this very, like, very wonderful thing about me. Very nerdy thing. 
because I got the notification as I was walking into Long Beach Comic Con to perform cosplay comedy. Hilarious. In a Luigi costume where I did this whole bit where I was just like this dude, this plumber from Brooklyn who was just like over the sh that his brother is making him do. That's fun. And I was like covered in blood and stuff. And I'm like, I keep getting killed by toitles. Are you kidding me? What the <laughs> f is wrong with you people? Stop jumping me into pits. I'm not a go-kart racer. I'm a plumber. You know, stuff like I that. Love it was this. very fun. But like, and and it, it was like you you planted a second battery in me that just was like this warm, energetic light. And that really is a lot of what you bring to the people around you. And it's one of the reasons that I think, you know, you are so beloved in this scene. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, this is uh I, I, I wasn't going to go take this back to me having cancer. Um, oh, I but, was going to, so oh, don't worry about okay, it. Okay, good. Thank God. Um, yeah, I mean, I have I have Hodgkin's lymphoma right now. Maybe stage three. Definitely stage three, maybe stage four. I'm waiting for the results of a bone marrow aspiration. But when I... The fact that you said I'm that I'm a light in this scene, I got a lot of a lot of messages last week when I announced that I had cancer publicly. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that hit me the hardest, and a couple of people said this, but the first person to say it was Jessica Michelle Singleton, who's a fantastic comedian. And she sent me and this, country music singer. And country music star. She sent me this message that was like, Alex, the committee and I have spoken. You have shined your light so hard for so many years on other people. Feel free to dim it for the next few months and just allow us to shine on you. Yeah. And what a perfect way of describing this, the, you know, in words that made me go, oh, I can take a step back yeah. and chill the f out for a little bit. It's weird because I just texted you saying, if you need me to punch the cancer, I'll do it. Yes, which exactly. Which I, which I appreciate too. I appreciate every single message that somebody sent me, whether it was whether it was sincere, whether it was a joke. Pete Lee calling me Pig Nataro, brilliant. Um, <laughs> I would have loved to have just sent you a picture of my c <laughs> yeah, I mean, my <laughs> dude, my cousin John is 64 years old and he goes, I heard you were asking for nudes and sent me the most artful nude of him like taking a selfie in a mirror. But there was a mirror behind him that I could see his ass. And I was just like floored. It made me laugh so yeah. hard. And that's it, it's a really it's nice that I'm seen that way. Yeah. Like somebody else reached out and said like uh, this, this comedian was like, Hey, you know, we're talking about you a lot in the women's Facebook comedians group. And we're just all talking about how great of a person you are. And I was like, Oh good. Because I'm sure normally when a man comes up, it goes, did you know he's a rapist? Yeah. And I, it's nice that a bunch of female comedians are going, Hey, Alex has cancer. He's always been a good person. What's so <laughs> wild to me. I, side, I don't need to sidetrack no. the cancer thing that the, the women in LA comedy, comedy group mm -hmm. that, that exists it's crazy how unwilling anybody is to show you a post from that they never um, will they, never they, they have it's, like it's like a witch's it's like the coven. mafia yeah yeah because uh, i've been I, I was like what she, you know like val will be like oh something in the group i was like what is it she's like you're not in the group right and i was like uh uh, that's fair. I was like, can't I just know that people are saying nice things and maybe read them so I can make myself feel? No, I'm not even going to ask. I'd so. say if you're a comedian, you should live your life in a way that if you're in an all women's Facebook group, that it's because of good things. Yes, very like, much that, so. That it's, you're just like, who's safe? Who's good? Yeah. And I do. I My whole thing was. Like that 2016, that Facebook project, I will say one of the most significant things I've ever done in my life, just, just because it, it there was no plan to it, but it was just me trying to make social media a better place to be. You did because then you inspired Quincy Jones to do the same thing. Did Qu Quincy did it for a while? He I know did. I had a couple friends. I knew I knew a bunch of people that started trying to do it the next year, but then they didn't they phased out too it's quickly. Hard it's to so do. hard. Yeah. The one person I know who succeeded was my friend Jerry Brandt, who is one of my best friends. He officiated my wedding. And he what he did was because I had taken it from somebody else. Somebody else had done like a two, like not an awesome person thing, but something kind of similar. My friend David Daskal did something like that. And when Jerry did it, he said, Well, I don't want to do exactly what Alex 
did. So what he did was he called it Sonics and Friends, and he did the same thing, but related it to um, uh, a band, an album, a festival, oh, a con- something where it was my memory of this person is here. Like I, I equate Jeff May with the band Silver Chair for X reasons, and this is who Jeff May is, and this is why I'm connected through this song. It's because I was a fat boy. Mm-hmm. Fat boy, yeah. wait till tomorrow. Please die. No. I'll add my favorite, uh, one of my favorites, if not my favorite song on the um, Godzilla 98 soundtrack was by Silverchair. There you go. Oh, entitled. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I loved, I loved it. I was inspired by something and then other people picked up the torch and said, let's keep this thing going as far as we can. And I. You know, it's just one of those things where just do do things that make you happy and let it flood into other people's lives however it will. I don't start any project thinking about the end result. You know, I, I it's just not the way I work. And maybe, yeah. maybe it would be better if I did, if I thought, oh, what's the goal here? Instead, I just start something and because I'm inspired and then I just make it you work. You learn how to make it work. Yeah. Um, so here's a fun thing. I don't know if you know this. Uh, I know you're a subscriber to the podcast. I of course. Know, I just totally know you are. Um, but that being said, uh, if uh, people subscribe at patreon.com slash Jeff May for the producer tier, there is a moment during the podcast where I read off the names. It's exciting, isn't it? That's super exciting. Then Let's me, go. Me and the guests can interact however we want about that. We can roast the names if we want, although there's like 90 of them. So like we don't have to roast everyone, but like we can comment on some of their names are just like, oh, it's, you know, Jessica Robertson. Thank you. And it's like, that's not really roastable. Way to um, go, Jess Rob. Yeah. Um, such as, for example, if you are uh, producer Lisa Harden, who's also my co-producer on Mint on Card. Uh, she is a producer as well as Kelly says, get your booster, you gaslighting dip turds. <laughs> Dip turns is fantastic. Um, this show is also brought to you by the guy who played JJ in Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon, uh, Silius Ruby, the Digital Phil, the Ghost of Dave Thomas, Fresh Never Frozen. Ooh, yeah. okay, that's a little frosty. The adopted Ghost of Dave Thomas. <laughs> he was adopted. Uh, the Great Advertising Scam, a Jeff May joint. It's coming, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, and I got to take Alex's uh, hints at. Just starting things and moving them. I have a show coming out called Radvertising that I've been working on about 90s commercials. Hell yeah. Um, shout out to Aaron Meyer. El Seldo would like to thank you, Jeff, for introducing us to your cool friends. So Hello. Hi. Uh, in Soviet Russia, we have cool Jeffs. Yes. Did you ever do a show with Yakov Smirnoff on here? No, I've seen him like once at the comedy store. I did a show and he dropped in at the comedy store and I was like, this is weird man it is it's it's wild when those legendary people just come in and do it would be like if gallagher came on yeah very like, much so and i would i would i would love to see that like yeah. people i watched a couple gallagher specials because i played him for a stick or treat the halloween show where we dress up like another comedian I was dying. He's not bad. Dude, I, I loved Gallagher as a kid. People put him in this position of that guy just smashes fruit. No, he was wearing one roller skate and alienating the crowd through political comedy. He was weird Carlin. It very yeah, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was very much talking about the mastery of the English language and he was very clever. He was a huge hippie. Talked about smoking weed when a lot of people weren't. Yeah. Like I loved Gallagher. It's people, we love to look back and go, well, that, that was dumb, right? And it's like, no, it's a moment in time. It's yeah. where, it's what we needed. Yeah. We needed, we needed this irreverent stupidity mixed in with these kind yeah. of just odd, innocuous opinions. And deep social commentary. Yeah. 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 I, I, cause I've said it before. I've been like, yeah, Gallagher was sort of like diet Carlin and people got so offended by that. And I'm like, just because you think he's hacky doesn't mean he wasn't important. Right. Like, it was a big deal. And the smashing watermelon stuff, I get it. But also, it's kind of funny. It is funny. <laughs> like, of I, course it's funny. I hate to admit it, but he would do shit like them damn video games and smash an Atari. Like, that's really funny to me. Like, that, that 80s era sort of like frustration, aggression, and, and, and that sort of release that you would get from it of seeing a man smashing 
pies with a hammer. So. Yeah, when I played him, I brought a watermelon on stage, but I said, I don't want to make a mess. And so I'm going to be like Gallagher and I just peeled an orange. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> Quietly. <laughs> just eating watermelon like in a contest. <laughs> Uh, it was me, Jeff. I've been giving you $10 a month since the beginning so you could afford more gas station Pop-Tarts, keeping you sluggish, just slow enough for me to steal Christmas. That's how you get cancer, everybody. Yeah, there it is. I had a gas station Pop-Tarts last night. Heck yeah. Well, I will see you in the chemo ward. See you in the ward, bro. We're doing stand-up chemity every two weeks, everybody. Yeah. just This one right here, it's called brown sugar cinnamon. This tumor right there. <laughs> um, yeah, cherries in the lungs. <laughs> Uh, I've never been more self-conscious, but I hate to bring this up. I've never been more self-conscious about my neck, by the way, than I have been the last like couple of months. You shredded, bro. I that well, that's the thing is most people are like like a couple of people know they're like something going on with your neck. You like getting beefed up, and I'm like um something like that. Yeah, yeah there's no there's heroin balloons hiding yeah, inside yeah. Of here. Some things are getting beefed up. It's, yeah. Have you talked to Ryan Telmo about this? Yeah, I yeah. went and did his, uh, I, I, I really degraded myself and went into the Corbin bowl last week just I, so I could see him. I love doing the Corbin bowl. Yeah. You know what? I, I'm going to tell you this right now. The, the treatment you get going to these Valley mics, as opposed to the treatment that you get when you go to a Hollywood mic yeah. is so different. You get treated like a, if you have, if you are good, you get treated like gold in the valley. You do. And I really, I just wanted to talk to Ryan about his experience and basically just, you know, their solidarity in yeah, this. For those that are listening uh, that don't know Ryan Talmo, he's, he's a great guy. He's, he, we called him the Valley Jesus. He, he was uh, struck with cancer and since then uh, passed it, beat it. Had a baby. And started a family. Yeah. All the things that people told him wasn't, weren't going to happen. And uh, yeah, I went on, I went there and I just said, you know, guys, I, I was diagnosed last week with the same kind of cancer that Ryan had, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so my worst nightmare is coming true. I'm a hack. And, you know, immediately, like, just joking about it. Like, yeah, yeah that's the word. It's not that I have cancer. I just, I yeah. can't believe I have to follow. Yeah, now you have to start an open mic at the Pickwick. Yeah. <laughs> now I have to listen to your cancer jokes to make sure I'm not biting on them yeah, right? while I write my own. Uh, do you have a, a travel snack? Because the gas station Pop-Tarts are my travel snack. Th those and uh, pizzeria pretzel combos. So do you have a travel snack? That's like one of my favorite questions. It, it, may, it used to be pretzels, but then my wife has begged me to stop eating so much gluten um, during all of this. And so I mean, because I think pretzels are just such a great choice because they're like they're. I like the texture and there's, they don't get on your fingers and they're like glass bread. Ooh, glass bread. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. And so I think it would be pretzels. Um, I love beef jerky. Beef oh, jerky is a really good one. That's the cancer. Like jerky or like or like sticks or like, no, like not the sticks. Yeah. No, like I buy the actual little like bags that cost fourteen dollars for three ounces or whatever. Yeah. You know, I like that. We used to have a guy when I used to work at a trucking terminal when I was in college. There was a guy that would do line haul like long drives to Pennsylvania and back, and he would stop at this like jerky spot that made like the best jerky ever and he would get he would literally leave our terminal with like a thousand dollars in cash from the people that worked there to get jerky oh baby yeah i yeah. love those little those little homemade jerky stores i'm also no surprise to anyone who knows me but i love lollipops and i just like having them and sucking them down in my mouth so. that that word is in my notes and we're going to address that too hey ma'am um we uh the show thank you to three jacob tremblies in a trench coat sneaking into an r-rated movie <laughs> i feel like by now jacob you can probably get into it but you know that name's been the same for a while you're probably 17 uh <laughs> shout out to parker aylesworth it's not that tall he has fake legs uh shout out to christy salinas kale's only true purpose is as the garnish at a 1996 pizza hut buffet wow i don't know if you knew that <laughs> Uh, shout out to at the pajama on Instagram for pictures of my feet it's of strength. Shout out to the pajama for that. Yeah. Uh, verbose minimalist world's humblest man, <laughs> Adam Warlock. He wants your soul ass of bass. The local man at Gavin underscore not with two T's not, t uh, Jen be earnest and enjoy what you love. What a sweet name to put in the middle of the cesspool of names that I have here. Yeah. Where somebody's like, fart. I mean, I also like, respect fart. Uh, 
Uh, we shout out to Nicholas simply having a wonderful man bun time. <laughs> uh, Fabian, uh, this is a reference to the Therese Corotolo episode in which simply having a wonderful Christmas time is my least favorite song. And uh, man buns, I'll never have one. Bam. Uh, Combine them. Gotham City OSHA. Uh, nice Tom and Jeff watch Batman reference. Jeff may convince me to quit Twitter and you should quit too because it's awful. Yeah, you're not wrong. Um, I don't care for pie. Oh God, it feels good to finally get that off my chest. Ah, the, the, you know, the truth that everyone's been waiting for. I do like pie though. Yeah. What's your favorite? I like a, like a dark cherry pie. Ooh. Like a, like a, like cherry with just like the lattice work on the top, like crust and cherry. Yeah. As opposed to like a black four. Well, that's more of a cake now. Yeah. Like I, like I would, like, I love a good like mud pie, like and everything too. But there's something about like just those, just those full Washington cherries. Just gooey and uh, it's so good. I do like a, I like a citrus pie. See, that's not really my thing. I like a key lime. Mm -hmm. I I do like a key, a key lime on a graham cracker crust will get me to the game every time. Gotcha. Um, a jocular, haggard, cantankerous fool. J-H-C-F, get it? Jeff has cool friends. Ah. Oh. Um, that's the shorthand for the show. So you'll get a lot of those, like J-H-C-F. J-H-C-F, yeah. Then, um, maybe some references. I don't know if people have updated, but a lot of times they tell me I don't like sports because <laughs> uh, of another podcast. Uh, shout out to Vortispin, Sex Marquise. Shout out to, you get the Aldo Vargas rookie card, everybody. Shout out to Ball Halls. Ball Hall. Yeah. Okay. Ball Hall. Interesting band. Yeah, but this one is spelled like uh, Korean buns. Oh. So it's ba- ba- B-A-O-H. A-U-S. Yeah, yeah okay. Ball Hall. Ball Hall. Ball Hall. Ball uh, Shout out to Boyd, PF, PDJF. Shout out to Koi Fam Art and Mentoring. Uh, also, a former guest of the show, Koi Fam. Excellent comic artist. Shout out to Nolan Void, Ricky Cilantro, Big Booty Boy for 2069. That that was my screen name in high school, everybody's. <laughs> what, AOL Messenger. What was your screen name on AIM? Cyberhunk69. That's what it was when I was 14. And then when I was 16, I changed it to Saddam Gave Me Head, which was my email for a very long time until an agent was like, this can't be your email. Uh, I had two. Uh, but the one that stands to be my favorite was, uh, Rocky five sucks. I like that. Uh, Rocky V sucks. Technically you get it. I did. Saddam gave me head before he was dead and decapitated. So it became even funnier when it was. Someone's just like, Ooh, too soon. Yeah. Hey, he's still alive. Let's be nice to Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Uh, Maine more than Stephen King. You ever been been to Maine? I don't think so. Actually. It's fine. I've hit like 38 states, I think. And I feel like Maine has eluded me. Do you, would you like to be in like Mississippi, but cold? Yeah. Maine. I mean, Maine is beautiful. I yeah. know that. I mean, yeah. I've been to like Vermont and New Hampshire and stuff like that. And it's gorgeous. Up yeah. There. So it's like, take Vermont, make it like a l- more racist. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I consider Maine the South of the North. Ooh. Uh, I went to college there and that's, that's a good way of, of viewing it, I think. Once you get off of like the early coastal elite areas, you know, like once you get past Kennebunkport. My wife used to uh, do be a council, a summer camp counselor there at the, I think it's the same town that they use in Wet Hot American Summer. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I did, I did my camp counseling. I was an archery instructor. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I was I was the athletic director as well, which meant gym teacher. Yeah, I was the learn how to aim straight for the heart, everybody. Oh, get it. I had to I had to do some uh, first aid on a kid who tore his leg open. Oh, like, shit. It was I thought I would freak out, but instead I was very calm. That's good to know about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely an interesting thing. Uh, jumping rope, still a sport. Jeff not liking it. Still a fact. Yes. Jennifer Fendelander, bodacious, big, bad, bouncing, bollock bonanza at AV Foundry. Patrick Dore. Dore. I think he told me how to pronounce it and I forgot. And I feel like a piece of shit over that. Uh, Bart Fartigan. Oh, Roan's the best cat. That's my cat that we just lost. I know. I saw that. I'm sorry, dude. My best buddy. I love him so much. Thanks for loving him so much. That's important. Uh, Shout out to Huey. Nerd numbers. The return of Magnolia Thunder. (laughs) Uh, Rudy, Daft Punk has an anime, Rueda. Daft Punk has an anime? I didn't know that. No. You know now, buddy. Yeah, I know nothing about anime. the world of anime. Yeah. Jeff hates competitive fun. 
Yeah, there you go. Yep, yep, yep. That's a twofer right there. Jism also... Horse Crust Farm. Yeah, there it is. Because that one is just JHCF, but also you don't even like sports. Competitive fun. Bam. Uh, let's see. Shout out to Goji, Gregorio. Odessin Molotov says, topple the patriarchy. Get today. Yeah, buddy. Uh, shout out to Gerard Ruane. Shout out to Farty Marty's Nerdy Party. Shout out to eat and die Grand Canyon. Love that. You been in the Grand Canyon? Yeah. Not a fan. Not a fan? No. You know, I uh my there's a story in my family where one of my like distant cousins, they went all the way to the Grand Canyon. They asked him how it was. He goes, ain't nothing but a big hole in the ground. <laughs> Kinda. I know. And also, like, I've seen the pictures. It's pretty, it's pretty awe-inspiring though when you actually walk up to that edge and see it for real. At least it was for me. I don't know, man. Have you ever eaten a cheesy gordita crunch from Taco Bell? <laughs> yeah, millions also, of them. Pretty f- awe-inspiring that's true that's very true it shows how strong man can be that's true it's that it's that special sauce that holds the soft tortilla into the hard shell it's the cheese that goes in there and then they have the oh Oh, yeah i say that whenever people are like you know authentic street tacos are the best i'm like yeah but the flavor palette of a cheesy gordita crunch is literally insane it's really good it's so good it's like honestly it's so tasty that i'm just like yeah i get that it's not like real meat but I don't. I didn't care. sign up. I went to Taco. I'm in my car. Yeah, I'm not gonna expect someone to hand me meat in my car. This is <laughs> sawdust and rats. <laughs> if you think that sentence completely out of context, I don't expect someone to hand me meat in my car. Ask a hundred people what they think that means, and you will get a hundred different answers. Uh, yeah, but ask a hundred people that work at Taco Bell, and they're like, "He's talking about the cheesy gordita He's, crunch." Of course he is. Yeah, yeah. those Mexi melts don't sell themselves. Yeah, everybody. It's sawdust and possum meat. Yeah, it's fine. Mm. Alex, show me in the rules where it says a dog can't play basketball. I yeah, I've read the rule book and I never saw, found it. You sure so. can't. So why don't you loosen up the collar a little bit? <sighs> Because you're thick neck. Exactly. Uh, Gray man of the nightmare potluck. Everyone is welcome at the table. Jeff using deep blue sea memes to break bad news. Uh, <laughs> did that for Betty White. And somebody asked me to do that uh, when the queen died. Oh, yeah. Which was today. Yeah. Unfor- I was the other. Yeah. But that's for bad news. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I just, there were some really funny tweets going out today about like, I, mean, somebody, I saw one that said, everyone, bad news. The second plane has hit the queen. <laughs> I saw I, that too. Yeah. I thought that was so uh, funny. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, we are recording this the morning that that happened. Uh, yeah. I know the, this episode's going to go up a little bit later than that. But sure. So, so you guys remember how, like, you know, a week and a half ago that happened? It was good times. Hello. Uh, I did one where I was just like, fine, I'll be the queen. Uh, I did one that that didn't go well that I thought was really great where it was uh, it was a wrestling reference to money in the bank where people would cash in their chance and I was like Prince Charles running into the Queen's hospital room and it's like a <laughs> gift of him with the money in the bank suitcase being like come on let's go you know shout out to the Queen though for uh, her amazing work in Naked Gun the first Naked Gun movie so good yeah she yeah. really is a pro in that one and Weird Al Weird Al's in that too isn't he is Weird Al in that one? That very well could be. I can't picture it right now, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he is. Yeah. Oh no, he's in the third oh, one. The third one. Okay. He's in the third. I was like, where is he in those movies? He's in the third one when they're doing when they're at the Oscars, I, and he he comes in there and he, he's wait. getting off a plane. Right? Wasn't he like? I remember him going into an award show. I think he goes as he's going into the Oscars. Yeah, he might have done. Several. Is he in multiple uh, naked gun movies? It I'm, wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I mean, he very well could be. And now I'm like, yeah, I have to look this up. He actually did a uh, uh, he did a song with Portugal the Man, and it's a serious song. Oh, awesome! And where he's like doing lyrics with that. Yeah, he's in uh, Naked Gun, getting off a plane. It looks like he's wi- he's like given flowers and stuff like oh, that. Okay. So it looks it looks a bit like uh, like he's winning something. Because he's he's being given flowers. Oh, I think they're like celebrating him, and Frank gets all like Leslie Nielsen gets up. He's like, "Thank you, thank you," yeah. like not realizing it's not about. Yeah, they like it's the guy that saved everyone. Yeah, so good though. Yeah, God, I love weird. I have my VHS of UHF over there. I still have it. Classic. Um, shout out to Tyler Wilgus asking seven in the time since he changed his name on this document. Jesbot had a kid, got a new job, and got COVID. Jesbot, I love you. I'm gonna request humbly that you reset that name because that kid is going to be six years old by now. <laughs> and hopefully the COVID didn't take over and that's why you haven't changed the name. I hope not. 
Uh, shout out to Kimball, the casual Frankenstein, the target loss prevention officer currently hunting Jeff. I shop, I shoplift from Target. Love that. Just M and M's. Okay. Just peanut M and M's. Do you ever shoplift? Yeah. I used to when I was a kid. I get my thrills in other ways now. I'm Drugs. too. I'm too afraid to do it. Yeah. I mean, I just like I. I think about it all the time, and I just I don't pull the trigger. It is a bit thrilling. Of course it is. There's, I mean, it's you're not you you're like you. Of course you can afford a bag of M and M's. They're not doing it because you can't afford them. You're yeah. doing it because there is the, that for that fire to li- get lit up inside you. For me, it's the tax that I'm making them pay for me shopping in their big box store. I like that. that, yep. that I'm just like, all right, man. I'm making the concession, but I am going to steal from you. Yeah, you're contributing oh. to world yeah. to world's evil, so I'm going to take what I can from you. Right. Uh, we have a uh, shout out to uh, <laughs> Stephen. And then I'm having trouble reading this name because I am illiterate. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Cody Beck, Mike Gouts, Lisa McCarty at Comics Book Girl. Comics with an X, girl with a U. Aeschylus and his tortoise. That's one of the questions I didn't know. On bullshit. Ooh, Dr. DNA. Hooray for Pontius Pilate. Uh, Shout out to that scene in Meet Joe Black where Brad Pitt dies. (laughs) It's nice that they sure. signed that up. For yeah, you know, like very much so. That that scene takes a moment to ship me, give me some money. It's really a shame Brad Pitt never did anything after that. No, poor guy. Poor Claire Forlani. Yeah. Oh my god, dude! I had the biggest f-ing crush yeah. on Claire Forlani. Like that to me. Like she is so in my wheelhouse of what I'm into in every possible way. Like I would watch that terrible movie Boys and Girls, and what's the other one? The uh, not Entrapment. The um. Uh, antitrust yeah. anti like i'm watching these terrible movies just because claire Forlani's in them mall rats i miss her god she was the last time i saw her she was on like a uh, whiskey commercials hmm. looking the same she's one of those people where like i bet we could reach out to her and get her on a pod or something yeah like, like that getting getting point. a hold of like willa ford or something like that and you're like you seem like you would be around yeah exactly yeah. you haven't oh. done anything yeah that's fine <laughs> i'm desperately trying to get dan cortez to come onto a podcast who's that uh, Dan Cortez, uh, MTV Sports. He uh, he was in Seinfeld as the bro that George had a man crush. On. Oh, okay, sure. But his big thing was like he was like the MTV jock, and he was the host of the Burger King commercials. The I love this place. Oh, okay. And he, he I never is, and I never put those together. In my opinion, he's the linchpin of '90s advertising. He's love so, that. He's so f- important, and I I can't get a hold of him. I'm trying so hard. <laughs> And I can't get a hold of him. Um, uh, I'm never going to have a history podcast, you little shit, So stop asking. Shout out to Mackenzie. Sisyphus may be happy, but he's into CrossFit. So f- chill. Mackenzie, I don't know if Sisyphus is into CrossFit so much as just he has to get the boulder up. I mean, I get where she's going with that, though. I get it. Mackenzie's a dude. Oh, sorry, Mackenzie. So you're a sexist. Yeah, basically. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean to pronoun you. You know, in the wrong way. I actually ran into him at a um, Frank Turner concert. Oh, cool. Yeah, because I I recognize he's got these really great shoes, and I know those shoes because he comes to Mint on Card a lot too. Uh, and so I saw him at the Frank Turner concert. I was like, oh, sh-. what a fun reason to recognize someone I seeing their know, shoes, right? Uh, Instagram and Twitter's at Bob underscore of underscore skull, who I would like to add has just told me that he has lost 70 pounds. Nice. Good for you, dude. And do you lot- also have cancer? Uh, no, he's got motivation. <laughs> oh, partially because of you, because, and I'm going to put this out there. Um, I post the boxing videos that I do the workout videos, the, I did the thing videos because I felt stupid about it and was talking to you. We were at like dinner. Or something you and I were having lunch or something like that. And you would and I was like, yeah, I feel weird posting these videos. Like it's not. And you were like, no, no, no. Like you should document this process. Cause I was talking to you about the slack lining videos mm-hmm. that you did. And you were like, no, you're gonna help people when you do this. Yeah. It's it, it's those little things that we feel self-conscious about. We're gonna like, should I really be like, is this what I want to be promoting? Is this how I want to be putting myself out there? And you don't know who you're gonna turn that day who's just gonna open up that feed and go, Oh, I could do that. You just don't know. It's something. And so, yeah, he mentioned that to me. He messaged me on Instagram and told me that. And I was like, oh, my God, that's he's like, still got a long way to go. I'm like, do not dismiss a 
70 pound weight loss. That's huge. I mean, like when Laura Bites lost 40 pounds, she said I lost eight bags of potatoes. And I just think like, what a great way of looking at it. Yeah. And yeah, this guy has lost what? Five pounds. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, 14 pounds of 14 yeah. bags of potatoes. That's crazy. That's very significant. Yeah. Dude. That is so awesome. Uh, Sergeant Pepper's hot dog flavored water. Gross. <laughs> Super gross. Right. I feel gross saying it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We can't mix the Beatles and Limp Biscuit together, everybody. Yeah, the limp, that's mean to Limp Biscuit. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, shout out to Lemming Malloy. Shout out to Norm from Cheers. Burrito Mouth. Dan Hackroyd. Hey, as long as I we're love br- that. That's Dan Hackroyd. Yeah. Hey, as long as we're bringing back Pepsi Blue, let's bring back the Bigfoot from Pizza Hut. Remember the Bigfoot pizza? Oh, yeah. It's like a giant sheet pizza. Uh-huh. Yeah, there was a pizza I used to get in college in Pittsburgh from this place that was 28 inches in diameter, and it was so large that they had to turn it to put it, get it through your door. They had to, they had to flip it diagonally. Like wreck the pizza to do, get it in. There, Pretty yeah. close to it, yeah. That's but like, it was great for parties. That's like Big Mamas and Papas here. They mm-hmm. have like the big. Uh, they have like a 36 or a 54, yeah, it, or something insane. insane. I remember. Kyle Clark and I at Nerd Melt, we would every once in a while, we would split like a huge pizza and then we would eat it in the back. And when we were done, we would just bring it out for the rest of the open mic comics if they wanted it. Mm-hmm. Where it was like, let us eat because we're hungry. And we yeah, don't, and these, because we live in our cars and, and we don't yeah, have any food. Comedians are savages. Um, but when we were done, we were like, hey, if you guys want pizza, I'll have at it. Yeah, and Big Mamas and Papas at that point when you've only been sucking down Little Caesars, that's like a Wagyu steak right there all of a sudden. Yeah, it's quite... Oh, uh, Pepperoni and uh, pepperoni and uh, ricotta. Ooh. That's my, that's like such a good mix. Um, do you have like a go to trash pizza or did you? I'm assuming you're not allowed to eat them now. I can. I, funny enough, while I'm trying to eat pretty healthy, I can also kind of eat whatever I want right now because uh, like weight's kind of fallen off me. It's a weird like kind of gift of this. Um, but a trash pizza, I mean. <sighs> Last year, I got a Papa John's for the first time in God knows how many years, and I it did it was very nostalgic to eat it. There's something about that garlic butter dipping sauce and the sugary like oh, the that tomato sauce is like sugar, very yeah. sugary. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really I when I eat pizza, I try to get good pizza at this yeah. point. Like I'm, I'm one of those people that's like. Why I'm like, why does pizza cost forty five dollars? Then I get it. I'm like, oh yeah, that's why. Do you, it's do you have amazing. a spot out here in LA that you like to go to? Prime through? Pizza. Prime Pizza. Oh, Prime that's great. Pizza. They, uh, there's one in Burbank as well. Yes, there is. Prime Pizza on Fairfax is actually right near uh, where I stay a lot. Yeah, it's so. uh fantastic. Very good pizza. Yeah, they do a good one. What do you get? The grandma? I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it's got like the it's a square. Mm-hmm. Doughy, yeah. Uh, this is very of L.A., but we're out comedians that live in L.A. Yeah. You ever go to Village Pizza? I used to in Larchmont. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that place. Was, that's like probably my favorite pizza. That was one of the first like, hey, L.A. pizza doesn't have to suck. Try this one. And yeah. I was like, oh, OK. Yeah. The, the, this whole thing where people are like L.A. pizza is bad is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's so dumb. There's definitely good pizza out here. You just have to find it. And it's, it costs more than $8. Yeah, unfortunately, but it's, people. it's not hard to find. Like, no. Like even like the kind of trashy pizza, like like you know Fresh Brothers or something like that, it's good. Yeah, like I never understood like the snobbery of people, especially it's people who have lived in New York. Yeah, and they're like, hey, this ain't the same. It's like, why? Because you are now here, and the thing you used to like is not here. So dumb. I'm so sorry. Yeah, eat a f- pizza and shut your mouth. Thank you. Also, I will. Pizza in, pizza in New York is fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's been sitting there usually for. F- 10 hours when you get it and so i i always make fun of like the regional pride of food because it's like philly is a great example that we're like our cheesesteaks it's like i don't know man have you ever had a cheesesteak in like omaha they're also pretty good yeah it's fine yeah they know so the bread i'm like the bread's fine (laughs) like i can maybe main lobster be but that's just because it's sweeter it's like the literally the flavor is different as opposed to like when you get it out of the bay here it has a, a a slightly different flavor, but people are like, yeah. oh, so you would eat clam chowder in LA? Yeah. And you're like, yeah. For sure I would. Yeah, and I'm sure it'd be great. Yeah, it's what pretty it's pretty good at Connie and Ted's if you never had that one. Yeah, so. it's that, that whole, you, uh, yes. What about our spaghetti in Cincinnati? Yep. What about our chili? Skyline chili, dude. It's gross. It's gross. 
I, Jeff May, believe that there is no better streaming service than Tubi to watch Armand Asante movies. And uh, that's true. Yeah, okay. That's true. And then uh, also, uh, finally, thank you to Itty Bitty Millie Committee, Pity the Fool. Love it. Um, if you would like me and uh, my guests in the future to say your name and talk about it uh, and maybe deal with a question prompt or something like that, feel free to head on over to patreon.com slash Jeff May. Sign up for that producer tier and uh, we'll we'll do that. I have no qualms about just debasing myself for you. I love it. Please for do. A, a, for a very small amount of money, yeah. I will debase the shit out of myself that's the point of this career a couple of things now i have i have more to talk about we have a little bonus content to discuss after Dig this it. as well you released an album called calm down peasants tell me about that process that was my second album came out this past february i was about to record it in april of 2020 and obviously couldn't do that for a few reasons so it got pushed a year and a half and i'm a person who I, as much as I think specials are great, I don't really enjoy watching specials because I'm surrounded every night of my life by live stand up comedy and being in the room. And to me, audio albums engross me more because I can, if I'm at home, and I put on a TV, there are distractions all over the place. I can pick up my phone, I can walk to the fridge, I can do whatever. If I put on an album in my car, I am immersed. You're focused. I'm yeah. in the room. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm there with you. And that's why I'm such a big proponent for audio albums for stand-ups is just because I think it's it's a more pure form of listening. Oh, you're really listening it's to hyper -focused, it. It's hyper-focused, yeah. Yeah, you're not you're focusing on the performer. You're not like, "Oh, look at this guy in the crowd laughing with his wife or whatever it may be." And um the album was um pretty personal. Uh, there's a lot of bits on it that are very much like you learn who I am. There's actually a giant through line. Every bit is about me growing more as a person. And it does lead to this massive, huge closer that is a kind of button on everything where there's a four minute voiceover um, included in it. And you're like, it's very, because when I do it live, it's obvious because there's voiceover that comes over the audio or over the sound system, but I'm standing there not saying anything. So I made sure that on the album, people knew something was happening and it wasn't me speaking anymore by adding reverb and echo and stuff like that. And I'm super proud of that album. It, it was it was hard to record because I didn't do it in front of like my crowd necessarily. No. I um, did it at, on, at the end of a two week long tour. And the, where did you record it? In the Arcade Theater in Pittsburgh. I went to school in Pittsburgh. I hadn't been back since. And I wanted to like have that nostalgia. And there was something about it where it wasn't necessarily like I didn't like have the the crazy set where you walk off. You're like, wow, I murdered that. I walked off and I went, I did it. That was a lot of work and a lot of me pulling the audience with me because a lot of this material was very me. And if you just show up to a comedy show and I'm not just giving you joke after joke after joke, which my, my stuff is pretty punchline packed, but you don't know what you're going to see. And I'm really proud of that album. And going back, I've listened to it a couple of times and it is what it was supposed to be, mm -hmm. I think a timestamp of my life that uh and a growth from my first album and i think that's the most important thing speaking of growths uh tell me about the can't no uh, yeah right no, there's lots of that uh has that first oh yeah how can we get that album it's everywhere. Uh, Spotify, you can buy it off Amazon or a special thing records, uh, their website. There's uh, my first album's out too, Hugs, Drugs, Pugs. So either of my albums, if you have any sort of streaming service, whether it be Tidal or Google, Apple Music, whatever, or Spotify, you can play these things. Yeah. And I, especially the second one, the first one you can listen to kind of bit by bit. And it does like you could shuffle the tracks and it, it like there is it's cohesive, but there's not like a through line. It's a very LA stand-up set where it's chunks of five to 10 minute. Bits. Exactly. Yeah. That the we're, second, we're forced to have to learn how to do. The second one was really put together with a massive theme. And mm -hmm. so I do suggest listening to the second one when you actually have a full hour to commit. Yeah. I, and I, and I would agree. I, I think you're incredibly funny. Oh, um, so we have that. Um, has the diagnosis like because the diagnosis all things considered the form of cancer that you have is 
not i hate to say it because it's worth i know it's, it's not the worst right it's not a this isn't it's it's not a death sentence kind of cancer this it's not is, like stage four terminal pancreatic cancer no or like here's that. here's how the doctor came out and he said mr hooper this is what we were hoping for which for a doctor to tell you you have cancer and immediately say this is what we were hoping for is such a jarring moment in your life um and i'm already like doing bits about that on yeah. stage of like oh this is what you were oh let me tell you what i was hoping for because you're, you're essentially going to eat sh for a while yeah you know you're going to go through a nightmarish process six months minimum yeah. chemo you're going to lose that luscious head of hair i might yeah there's a good chance for that but this is a you're, you're going to start a family after this, according from what we've seen. A hundred percent of the comedians we know that have gone through this. Yeah. Came out the other side with a, a life that was significantly better than the life they had before. And I don't want to use someone like Ryan Talmo as an example, but it's a good he's a great paragon for the hope that can come through something like this. Yeah. And one thing I've had to learn through this is because obviously you just think like why you, you do go through the why me where did I go wrong? What blah, 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 blah. Why is this happening? And there's certain things I've had to learn that have been very, very helpful. One of them in a Ram Dass meditation that Dave Yates sent me, um, he said, it's all about the positive spin on cancer. And he said, you don't have cancer. Your body has cancer. Your Ooh. soul doesn't have cancer in the same way. Like that. And I have to think about, like, I think about that now for my eczema. I don't have eczema. My body has it. And that's something that my meat sack costume has to experience and deal with, but that doesn't t affect my soul at all. Look at all the people that are reaching out that suddenly care about, show how much they care about you through cancer. But the other thing that I've had to really, um, that's been really difficult is the letting go and the sh I should have this because like all like last week was Burning Man and I love Burning Man and I kept saying I should be a Burning Man right now and then my friend was like should you because you're not and if you should wouldn't you be there and that's a good point I was like it's not there's no should have been like you just have to place your cards as they're dealt to you yeah. and if I drop the word I should have done this I should have done this I should be here in my career well then. I'm I'm holding on to aspirations that maybe aren't healthy for me. No. And so by dropping the word, sh I should be this, it really has helped me through this process. Because like you said, like, honestly, I said it in my, my YouTube video. This is only going to make me more likable, like more <laughs> sympathy points, more like, you know, more reasons to root for me. Make it to the finals in AGT next time. Exactly. I mean, it's it's a curable form of cancer. Yeah. And most and the thing is, and when I say I'm stage three, maybe stage four, what I've learned about this type of cancer is that is that just means it's more advanced, like it's everywhere. It's it's in my pelvis, it's in my armpits, it's in my neck, it's all over. But that doesn't mean it's more deadly. It just means it's spread more. It's better that I have like stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma than stage two lung cancer. Yeah. So that was something that I didn't know that I had to like learn through research and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, you, it's an adv it's an advanced headache as opposed to brain cancer. You know, I'm not comparing that to a headache, but you know, no, what I mean? like, but that's it's the it easier. Is. It's the it's the easier thing to be dealt with and survive. Well, that's a, it's like what is what are the gifts that I can pull from this? Because first of all, this is going to sound bizarre, but I think you're you will understand your listeners will understand. I was so, I got married in April and since then I've had a litany of health problems because that's essentially when this started. I'm not saying they're related, but also, yes, they are. Don't do it, everybody. It looks like somebody's um, trying to get out of his marriage already. Hello. Oh. I said till death do us part. You're not getting out after five months. Sorry. <laughs> um, it was one of those things where I was so depressed and confused and I hadn't felt that way in a long time. It un uh, uninspired, couldn't come up with my next comedy project, wasn't liking what I was doing overall and I was tired a lot and I kept thinking like, what, I'm in this funk and I don't know what's wrong with me. And then you find oh, out- Oh, you have cancer. Oh, you have cancer. Yeah. And part of me was relieved. I was like, oh, it's a physical thing. Like I am- I'm actively dying, like I said. So that's the reason why maybe you haven't wanted to start a new podcast or something like yeah. that. Like there's little, it was like, okay, then let me get through this and take whatever breaks I need to. But also I'm going to capitalize on this because I am a f 
monster and there's no way I'm getting cancer and not using it to every advantage that I have as a performer. So it's, this is just something I have to go through now. It's it, part of my story. It, it's also though, it's a reminder of the inspiration that you can give to people where you're like, I'm suffering. Yep. And I'm here for you, even though I'm suffering, like I'm, I'm not giving up. You shouldn't either. Yeah. I always, you know, I mean, obviously this is totally different. They're not even in the same ballpark, but even when I post those like boxing videos on Instagram, the last thing I always say is you're doing great. Yeah. Cause I sure. want people to know that even if you're, even if things are hard and you're struggling and everything like that, you're here, you're, you're here, you're seeing this, you're on a phone on Instagram, you're doing great. You're doing great. If you are looking at social media, yeah. you're doing great. And even if you don't feel like you're doing great, or even if I don't feel like I'm doing great, I can still remind you that you are. Yep. That it's, it's better than we realize that the, the sh that falls on us it stinks for a bit and then we shower it off that's it that's it and this honestly will just strengthen everything that i am and i believe in about how to live a life that is fun exciting and how to who am i at my core like i'm all about personal discovery and trying to be the best version of myself and if cancer is going to be another teacher then so be it it's bizarre, but like as much as I'm saying F you cancer, I can't believe you chose me. I'm also going, I love you cancer and thanks for being inside of me and try, go ahead and try to murder me because yeah. you're not going to win. You chose me. Yeah. Wow. wow. I just feel like the debutante coming out of the ball. <laughs> yeah. And right. Like you're, you're just some Jane Austen character with all these different kind of cancers trying to like propose to you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm prostate cancer yeah. and you might not survive me, but Mr. Mr. Hodgkin's lymphoma has said very nice things about my neck. Hello. Mm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a hilarious idea to line them all up and be like, this is the kind of cancer I am. Are like, yeah. you ready for me? And it's like, well, I am testicular cancer. Do you want a 50% chance of it not hurting when you get kicked in the nuts? <laughs> Come see me. Why well, I do declare. <laughs> Remember how Jane Austen used to write southern love stories of course so what are you know what can we learn from all this and that's what i have to teach myself and that's the, what i try to by i think by being honest it's just the best path forward and i'm not a, obviously i'm not a i'm very open i'm very vocal i don't hide what's going on with me and so that's why i was like the best way for me to handle this is to put out a video saying hey guys I have cancer and this is how I want to be treated. And this is what you need to know. That way you stop asking me questions and you don't, I don't have to explain myself again and again and again. Yeah. And that's good. Cause I stole your identity as soon as that happened. Perfect. That's all you, I've ever you, wanted. You were like, you were like, don't treat me any different. I'm like, well, that's good. Cause I, and, just got this info and you know and you know what was the best um by the way yes the social security number is correct use it for everything um the next night i went to the comedy store and i had this like weight lifted off me because for the past couple months i've been going to all my spots and i haven't been able to hang out people are like how you doing man and i'm like i'm fine they're like just fine but you're alex hooper you're always doing great and i'm like uh -huh, i'm fine um i went to the comedy store and immediately people started giving me hugs and somebody um was just like well at least we know why you're so ugly. And I was like, thank you. Yes. One of my favorite roast jokes ever was about you. By, yeah. By Fifi Dosh. Oh, which one? You look like a melted Beethoven candle. <laughs> I don't even remember that one. That's brilliant. I heard, I heard her working on it, I think, in at Nerd Melt. It's, it's great. R.I.P. And it, it, it has been, in my opinion, one of the funniest roast jokes I've ever seen. She also said um, that I was, I looked like the moon in a silent movie. <laughs> and dude, I will tell you, when she dropped that joke, there was 15 seconds of silence. And then the room exploded and there was nothing I could do to not make them see me as that anymore. And this is the funniest joke. It's so funny. It's I was very fortunate to 
beat her in the battle where it, she beat me the first time and then I beat her in the battle where it mattered. You know, it's funny. I was supposed to do roast battle three different times. Yeah. And the three times I was supposed to do it, the comics backed out. <laughs> Huh? I was like, all right. I guess you see, see, and that's the thing. I was supposed to do roast battle. Yeah. No, you weren't. Yeah. Yeah. No, it it was weren't. like one of those things where we were like lined up, ready. To, and like early, like it was going to be one of those things where like, yeah, maybe this is going to be the career path that I'm on. And I was writing the, and then it just kept not going through. And I was like, well, I guess I'm doing something else then. Yep. Like I was like, clearly this isn't for me. Um, It's not anything that I thought was going to change my career. And I was just like, Hey, look, man, if everybody's just, afraid to do it or uncomfortable like i don't need to be that guy and maybe it's better that i'm not it's a very could have people have gone some dark paths by being on that path yeah look at me i'm dying you know that's what <laughs> yeah but that's funny <laughs> that's what howie mandel like posted on my page he's like you're so strong use comedy as your superpower you got this buddy and all i commented was like this is what happens when you say mean things on tv you know, <laughs> and there you go. He told me uh, on the show, he was like, we're going to have to do a show together. That's nice. What he said. And then they cut that out. <laughs> of course, <laughs> they, of course they, they Well, did. they edited out my whole win. So, like, it looks like I lost the game. Oh, crazy. I know. But also, I didn't. And I'm okay with uh, my bank account is fine. Better than the other way around. Yes. They're like, we're going to make you look like you're winning. Just so you know, you take your sandwich yeah, and go home. You're not getting anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was bummed that. That part got edited out because I was like, well, now I can't make him that. <laughs> Guilt him into doing a show with you like a fundraiser. Uh, you know, it's one of those hard things when people like him reach out and say anything you need. I just want to be like, uh, can we go on tour together? Yeah, can I have four hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> yeah. Uh, any. Yeah. Can I anything? Can I go on your podcast? It's like something, Howie. I don't know. But I don't. Why don't you? Why don't you go on his podcast? I don't want to ask. You f asked to get on the show on America's Got Talent. I know. Do you not think you think that it was a good idea to ask a producer to do it? But when I, if a producer said, if a producer of America's Got Talent came up to you and said, "Is there anything I can do for you?" Here's here's what here's why. Because I had a podcast for uh, a while, 136 episodes or so, and when people a podcast, especially when you're doing interviews, it's kind of personal who you want to talk to, and I always felt like it wasn't my when people. Sometimes people would pitch themselves with a great story and I'd be like, hey, this is what I'm going through and this is why I want to talk about it. I'd be like, okay, cool. And other times people would be like, I would love to do your podcast. I'm like, well, what's your Achilles heel, which was the theme of my podcast? And they'd be like, oh, I don't know. I'm just like, I just want to do as many podcasts as I can. And I'd be like, okay, I'm not saying no, that that's a bad thing because you do have to ask for things. But there's certain things where I'm like, you know, I was talking to my manager. She's like, you know, we might be able to use this for acting stuff. And I was like, you do that side of it. I don't want to beg casting directors to see me i'm interested in that because of how we started this and how we talked about it and how you were like you have to use what you have and ask to get these things that now that you have this very real diagnosis that you're going to survive yeah but you have this very real diagnosis and now is i know it's stupid and i know it's i know it's tacky but the, our career is tacky. Yes, our, but, our entire career path is tacky. So here's what it is. And I'm going to be very blunt about this. I don't. And this is kind of inside baseball. I don't want to Quincy Jones this thing. I understand. And um, for those of you that don't know what that means, there was a comic who had mesothelioma, very advanced cancer a few years ago. All of his dreams came true. He got on Conan, HBO special, all these big podcasts. Got on Ellen, these, yeah. Yeah, all these big things. And it... People don't look at them as legitimate credits because of the circumstances. Here's here's what I will here's what I'll say to that. Yeah. If, and this is gonna sound cruel, but if he was more prepared for the special, I think it would be a bit different. I don't think the fizzle would have happened. I I, I like yeah. I like him. I was there at the taping. Well, he admits he had never done that hour as an hour. Exactly. And that's, you don't, you don't film a special that you've never done before. Yeah. If he was more prepared, I think it would be differently. And this is true. And I'm, but th that's the thing is like, so I am going to milk this for all I can. However, I'm going to do it in a way that I feel services me that doesn't put other people in a position to want to, if people reach, if Howie Mandel reached out and says, buddy, come on my podcast. 
a hundred percent, I'm going to do it. But when I ask, I feel like I'm putting them in a position it's where like it's very difficult. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I don't want to be that. I will use this to my advantage. I will create a uh, jokes and a special probably out of this. Like I'm already thinking about how my chemo plan can lead up to that. Okay. So what if you were to reach back out to Howie after he makes that offer mm -hmm. and you say, you know, dude, Anything you can do to talk to me or, 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 or if you ever find space for me, please just think of me. Yeah. You know, something and like that where you don't have to say it, but it'd be like, hey, man, just when you have things going on or if, you're, if you need an opener or if yes. you have a slot on a show that you, you want to fill, I was like, just please think of me. Yes. And I think that's a very fair way to do it. Because one thing that I had to tell myself when I made that video and when I rewatched it, I didn't realize that in three different occasions, I go, I just want to do shows. Like I just kept repeating it because I wasn't, didn't plan Sucks that video that at all. that we just had you on Mint on Card. I know. now you're not allowed back. Don't worry. I've got, I got a pretty stacked schedule right now because of that uh, yeah, get a, get, a, get a cancer credit, everybody. People want you on the shows. But it is that thing where... I had to tell myself, Alex, anybody that reaches out to you right now and books you for something or asks you to do something, this is not a pity booking. You reminded them that you exist and maybe that, but also, because that's what I, but here's, the, I know, I know I you're would, making that face. No, I'm saying I wouldn't book you on my show if you weren't funny and had cancer. <laughs> like I, I, just, I sure. wouldn't do that because that would ruin the show. Uh, yes. And that's, but that's the thing is you have to tell, you have, to, I have to remind myself of that of like. Every show I've done in my 13 years of comedy, none of those were pity bookings. I did that because I, I got those shows because I am a funny person who is unique and has perspective and performs as hard as I can every time I show up to a place. I bring good energy. That's why people bring me back. And that's what I want this to be. So you're right. I could reach out and say, hey, I know you're thinking. I know you reached out. All I'm asking for is that you, if you have a big, like a show in Vegas or something like that, let me open, let Give, me do a yeah, podcast, if, whatever it may be. If you have an open opportunity, don't forget me. Yeah. And I think that's, and I probably will reach out to him today and say that. Um, Can I you name drop me, please? No. Oh yeah, of course. My friend, yeah, I remember Jeff May. Uh, My friend Jeff, who won on your show, but was edited out. He would like to host. So we have a whole thing planned. You, you know, what's funny is I was just thinking, I was just like, well, like a fundraiser that he was headlining and I hosted and then you could be like the feature or whatever. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. And then I was like, no, that's not about me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you talking about man yeah so there's this it's a it's a fine line right where yeah. like you know one of my biggest like inspirations and as a human um is a comedian and a comedian is duncan trussell because he has very much formed his own lane and been who been himself and figured out who he is and let other people follow he reached out to me and we know each other and he was like you know i would love to help anything you need and i did think that i was like man i would love to be on the duncan trussell family hour and talk about all this but he reached out. He is thinking about me. Yeah. If he wants me on there, he'll ask. And that's kind of how I saw it. How I see it is don't pop your cherry using favors through this, allow you to be present and in their mind. And then they will come to you yeah. when it's ready. I, I would say that too, that, that the announcement of the diagnosis was more of a beacon. It wasn't a cry for help, but it was a, you know what? I haven't had Alex on the show in a while. Right. Or, or I, I, you know, I've, I've been meaning to get Alex on the, on the podcast, on this show. I've been meaning to get you on and it's just shit happens. Things of course. Get weird. And then I was like, no, you know what? Like, this is a good idea to, to have you on and talk about it and to be able, like, it's not precious. It's not something that I'm not going to joke about with you, especially because I've seen the survival go through it. I've seen a friend. I, I, I seen a friend that I brought to his appointments every once, like, I've seen it. And that's why when I texted you, by the way, and I was like, anything you need. And I said, including rides or whatever. Like, I've yeah. done that. I've done it. And it's fine. I have a phone while you're getting your chemo or doing whatever. And like, if I'm just sitting in a waiting room, I'll do that. Uh, that's not stuff you talk about on a podcast, but. That's no, but the thing is, through. I'm handling this through very dark jokes. I said yeah. on stage last night, I was like, you know, my wife and I, we want to start a family. She's going to be an amazing single mom. And, you know, and the audience pulled back so hard. And I literally pulled the mic away and I was like, this is how I'm processing yeah. this, people. Let yeah. me make my jokes. If you don't laugh, you're the one who's wrong. Um. Alex, I'm going to keep you for a little bit when we, because okay. we're going to move forward and we're going to go, we're going to, I'm going to wrap up the main show. 
Dig it. Uh, first and foremost, though, I have a couple of things to say. First, uh, if you want to see more from Alex, go to hoopercomedy.com uh, for Alex's website, or you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Hooper Hair Puff. And uh, Alex Hooper has a fan page on Facebook that you can go to. Yep. And that's the main page. You don't do much on the on the. I honestly do nothing page. on Facebook. I like, I don't I, do anything on it I anymore. Just tell, I tell people I have shows. Yeah. Here's a show. If, you, if you're still on fucking Facebook for some reason, you should probably come to it. Yeah. Um, I, I have that. So um, what else? Oh, these are something that I want to talk about on the bonus content, which is why I was keeping it secret. But you can also check out Roast Yourself to Happiness. And you can download for free on your website, the ultimate guide to roasting your friends and not getting punched in the face. Correct. Um, so you, you have two roasting, uh, pieces of, of, of writing that you have done. Yeah. One is actually a self-help book. It's a, it's a four week program where I actually teach you how to write roast jokes about yourself to take away the judgment from other people. No spoilers, no spoilers at all. But the other one is just, if you sign up for my email list, which I only email when I'm about to go on tour or I have something major happen, I'm not a spammer and you get an email once every month or two from me. Um, you get the, free guide on how to throw a roast and that's just like a little nine step guide on like how to do it Boy, and yeah i was I'll t- oh, i actually have a funny story about roasting that i'll tell you in the thing are there any other things that we should be on the lookout where can we uh where can we find you on uh are there any are you on like tiktok or anything that i, I am on tiktok about? uh hooper comedy is what i am on tiktok i had a hooper hair puff account that i got locked out of somehow so unfortunately i had to switch it which whatever yeah i mean you can fi- i'm pretty easy to find yeah. uh i always but like you post my, your dates on the website all my dates are always on my website i'm always promoting through instagram and things like that and that's the main thing is i just want people to come out and see me live um or listen to my albums share my clips whatever it may be because like you know we're all fighting just to be seen through the algorithm and everything else and selling tickets is important to me that is I, that's what i want i want my shows to be filled yeah. and i can't go on the road for six months so i am actively trying to build my following in the meantime so when i get back out there and have a new special a new album whatever it may be i am packing those rooms have you thought about filming yourself doing comedy while you're receiving treatment yes uh yes i actually i absolutely have um i've thought about producing shows in the chemo like ward depending doing on doing like, a pod podcast while you're getting it or something like yeah, I how, mean, however long the 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 treatment takes the ideas are flowing through me right now and i'm writing down all of them and just discussing like the them with friends just like the cancer it's spreading everybody um and yeah i'm just talking about it with friends and trying to decide what the best course of action is to you know use this for good instead of evil Instead of being, I don't want people to be sad and depressed. I want people to be inspired, uplifted, and I want them to laugh. You are a genuinely inspiring person. Uh, and that Not on was, purpose. And that was before cancer. <laughs> yeah. So now this um, is, I'm going to be a monster on yeah, the other like, side of this, everybody. This is like the steroids of, of, of inspiration here. Because yeah. like you were already very inspiring and very positive. And getting through this and, and, and seeing you fight through it, it's going to be a little bit hard. But I know you're going to make this. Uh, you're going to make sure that everybody else is going to in- enjoy your process, I guess is the best way I can put it. Um, this is scary shit, everyone. But the thing is, cancer is the we don't talk about it much, but it's obviously affects everyone. And I'm trying to put my own spin to make you laugh and be comforted by the fact so that hopefully when someone you know is close to it or you go through it or whatever it may be that you remember these little tiny videos or whatever jokes that I made and go, oh yeah, it's okay to joke about this shit. It's, yeah. okay, it's okay to be like, like literally I left a show the other night and comics were like, I'll see you soon. And I went, or maybe you won't. <laughs> and you know, like, fine. That's, oh, God. have fun with it. I love that. So definitely follow Alex in all of his endeavors and, yeah. and uh, pay, pay close attention because he's got a lot of cool shit. Uh, if, for example, you are listening to this show for free, thank you so much. I have several other shows, including Tom and Jeff Watch Batman on the Gamefully Unemployed Network, as well as Unpopular Opinion and You Don't Even Like Sports, both on the Unpops Network. Uh, and if you want uh, uncensored early access to episodes with bonus content, you can head over to patreon.com slash Jeff May. You can get the, the bonus content Alex and I are about to talk about, as well as other shows like Ugg Fine. We have a podcast with me and Kim Crawl, our monthly show, and several more coming. 
coming. I'm trying to find ways to, to make the Patreon even more rewarding. Uh, I've got some uh, listener supported tiers that we, we have co- podcasts coming out soon. You might have noticed. So it's cool. Um, so check that out. Uh, Alex, say goodbye. I love you, Jeff May. Thank oh. you very much for having me. It's an uh, it's an it's an honor to be in your presence and to you know take up your precious time. Uh, like this. My time is relatively worthless. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, Alex, thank you so much, and thank you all for listening. Uh, patrons, stick around. We got uh, a couple more minutes to talk about. And if you're not a patron, uh, thank you. Uh, see you in two weeks. Okay, bye. Bye. Hey everyone, our artwork is created by Justin T. Brown, who can be found at Artness by Justin Brown on Instagram, as well as artnessbyjustinbrown.com. That dope music you heard is by Troy Nababon, available at Troy Nababon on Instagram, as well as at troynababon.com. Nababon is spelled